for part two, the Typhonians in history. Typhon <laughs> uh, is a Greek deity, of course, one of the Titans. He's a vast grisly monster with a hundred snake-like heads, with dark flickering tongues flashing fire from their eyes, and the din of voices and a hundred serpents issuing from his thighs. The Typhon leads the Titans when they attack and kill Dionysus, just as the Egyptian god Set is responsible for the murder of Osiris. Therefore, from the time of the Greek historian Herodotus, the Greek uh, Typhon has been ident identified with the Egyptian god Set or Seth. Typhon is an important component of the Hermetic tradition. Uh, hermetic magic is a magic that has its roots in ancient Egypt, just especially important during the time of the Greek conquest and occupation. A Typhonian in the ancient world is one of the four personality types of Egyptian and classical psychology. So four different personality types, uh, Set and Horus, Isis and Nephis. So I'm just going to focus on the Typhonian or the Setian type, where it said the God in him is Set. So the, if the God inside you is Set, um, Set, son of Nuit, greater strength, protection is at, thy hands of, at the hands of thy holiness, I am the son of thy son. So a Setian, a Typhonian. Being a bachelor, a bachelorhood was seen as a very Setian or Typhonian thing to be. Being drunk was another Sessian thing. Incidentally, the Egyptians didn't see drunkenness as a wholly bad thing. Drunkenness was to them an important way of communicating with the divine. They, those born on certain days were predicted to suffer, to die by being drunk. To die in a drunken stupor, if you like. But this was thought to be quite a good thing. Thus, uh, in the second month, on the sixth day, if you were born on the second month of the Egyptian year, on the day six, it was very, very good. It's a happy day, for Ra is in his heaven, and the gods are pacified in his presence. The company of heaven is making whoopee in front of the Lord of the universe. Anyone born on this day will die in a state of drunk drunkenness. Officially, ty Typhonians are disliked, either because they have red hair, or some other reasons are believed to be adherents of Seth. De the destiny of the Typhonian is subject to different laws. Uh, they live a, a fairly long time. They live, for instance, up to 84 years, according to the Egyptians. Uh, although, if they marry, sorry, if they uh, remain unmarried, they only live to, they live less, to 60, in fact. Although, some might say it's the other way around. If the God in him, in the person, is set, then he is a man of the people, the Reket. Uh, say, red hair, colour, and uh, kind of that sort of associated features. They are, Sessians are accident prone. There are some recommendations given by the ancient Egyptians. Sessians shouldn't drink, because if he drinks a beer, he drinks to it only to get angry and to engender turmoil. The redness in his hair becomes the, white, uh, becomes the red in his eye. Uh, and he drinks, even though he doesn't like drinking, just to get angry. So they shouldn't drink, really. Sethians or Typhonians like women, and consequently women like them. And a Sethian, even if a Sethian comes from a more patrician or royal background, he's likely to have the personality of a man of the people. And all of this, the Sethian, the Typhonian personality type, the most famous example is probably King Ramesses II, who was a redhead and lived a heck of a long time till he was 100, had a lot of wives and children, and uh, was not a good person to know when he was drunk, apparently. Okay, so Typhonian magic in terms of techniques is enormous. It's an enormous body of work and is still growing. I remind you, when Kenneth Grant wrote that, uh, about it being a magical tradition that included sex as a means of spiritual attainment, that, and also that it existed long before dynastic times, uh, 
that it was a highly specialised cult related to the Tantras of India, all that sort of stuff. All of that is essentially true, uh, in my opinion. And Grant's early attempts to describe it have, over the years, been greatly refined, and some of the details have been corrected. And But essentially it's correct. And my own researches have, in their own small way, have kind of been focused on trying to refine what kind of Grant earlier said. The publication, in 1986, the publication of the complete Greek magical papyri changed forever the older view of what was hermetic magic, what it was like, and changed what we know about the Typhonian. So uh, this vast publication of uh, material is full of Typhonian magic, really. It's not the only thing there, but it's a, it's a hugely important source for anybody who wanted to study uh, the, the magic of Set and Typhon. So it's, it's far too large for me to describe much of it. it, it uh, you know, there's loads of people engaged in this sort of stuff at the moment. So I'm going to focus on one small Typhonian spell which I've been studying for a little while now. And it's a typical piece of Typhonian or Setian magic designed to send evil sleep. So if anybody's asleep now, <laughs> you might want to wake up. Uh, this sort of magic is named, known as diabolic magic. Uh, diabolic meaning to tear apart, uh, as opposed in alchemy to the symbolic type magic which holds together. If you want to understand some of the un underlying principles of ty Typhonian magic, you have to look at some very unpleasant material. Uh, it's true now, and it was true in the past. Thus, we have to, we have to look at this sort of diabolic magic of uh, Egypt at about the time of Christ. Egypt had passed from a Greek to a Roman rulership. If you remember, Alexander the Great defeated the Persians and thus took over the Persian Empire, which included Egypt. Uh, and then eventually they kind of turned it into just another Greek colony with a sort of form of apartheid between the Greeks and the Egyptians. Eventually, uh, the Romans took over, you know, the whole incident with Cleopatra and Mark Antony and everything, and the Romans take Egypt into direct rule. Contrary to what you might think, that time when uh, Egypt is ruled by first the Greeks and then the Egyptians is actually a very vibrant period. It's a difficult period. The Romans, and before them the Greeks, impose a lot of harsh conditions. Uh, that make it very very difficult for the traditional temple-based religion to continue, especially under the Romans. They pretty much banned it in the end. They certainly uh, extracted all the wealth from it and made it very difficult to train priests. So most of what we know of the magic of the period comes from just one magician of that time. And his or her, it could be a woman, it could be a man, nobody knows. Their library, their magical library and their book of shadows was unearthed in the early part of the 19th century. We don't really know his or her name, so to make it more user-friendly, I'm going to call him Dewey, which is a name of the time. The magi this magician, Dewey, was a bilingual Egyptian priest or priestess who lived in Thebes. It's possible if you know a thing called the Mithras Liturgy that the Mithras Liturgy is an account of her initiation. The collection, this magician's library, is, the, is stem, so they think, or is a record of Huey's study holiday with the magicians of Alexandria. Life for the native Egyptian was difficult. Uh, they had to negotiate the apartheid system of the Greeks, then the transition to Roman domination, and finally the growth of Christian fanaticism. So like many other libraries of the period, it was hidden in the ground uh, for the benefit of a future self. The owner never really returned to claim his or her prize, uh, and the most likely thing that happened is that they shared the fate of others of his kind, or her kind, and were murdered by the mob, which was a common thing, and the library, if it had been found, would have been burned.